Dear congregation, I invite you to turn in God's holy word to Hebrew, the book of Hebrews. Book of Hebrews, and we're going to read a few passages before we get to the text in Hebrews 12. I'd like to really back up and see the context of Hebrews and what really spurs the author of Hebrews to write these words in the first two verses of chapter 12. In Hebrews chapter, oh, the book of Hebrews up to chapter 10, is setting forth the Lord Jesus Christ as far superior in all things that the Old Testament pointed to. So such as being a high priest, Jesus is far superior than any high priest that could have ever lived. <clears throat> he provided a far superior sacrifice than what was ever sacrificed before. And he's calling then, in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19, he's calling us to confess our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and what he has done. And we, we begin reading there in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19. <clears throat> Hebrews 10, verse 19. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more, as you see the day approaching. And then the author of Hebrews goes on to show us that, that indeed the just must live by faith. And out of that faith will come a right living and I'd like to pick up a reading then in verse 35. Verse 35. Therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise for yet a little while. And he who is coming will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith, but if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. And then in chapter 11, we find out what that believing entails, that is, faith. And he goes on to say in verse 1, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good testimony, by faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. And he goes on to show the faith of all of the heroes of faith in the Old Testament from the dawn of history to Abraham to, to uh, the patriarchs Isaac and Jacob and Joseph and the faith of Moses and uh, instead of reading all of that, you can read it again at home if you would like. But I want to pick up in verse 30, in verse 30, especially as we've had a series of sermons on, on Daniel as well, and to see a summary of those in faith, verses, verse 30. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they were encircled for seven days. By faith, the harlot Rahab did not perish with those who did not believe when she had received the spies with peace. And what more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, also of David and Samuel and the prophets who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, and became valiant in battle, to, turned to flight the enemies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again. 
Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Still others had trial of mockerings and scourgings, yes, and of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in the deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. And all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. God, having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Amen. May God bless the reading of his precious and infallible word and also add his blessing to the exposition of it. My dear Confession of Faith students and congregation and friends, as we come to this point of making confession of faith, then we recognize that something is happening. We recognize that you are owning your faith. You are saying, this is what I believe. This is my hope in life and in death, that I belong to Jesus Christ, my faithful Savior. And sometimes you're welcomed into the battle, as it were, the spiritual battle, the, the battle that the saints have in this world. But today we're welcomed, as it were, into a race, a race, a race that we find here in Hebrews chapter 12. But this is not the only race that's probably on your mind in this past week. As all around us we hear stories about the Olympics and the races and and. Andre de Grasse, and, and so on. All of these things come to our ears from Tokyo itself. And it's interesting to know that the Olympic Games were actually not just started in, 18, in the 1800s, but the Olympic Games actually began 800 years or so before the time of the Lord Jesus Christ in, in ancient, ancient Greece. And it And they lasted until approximately the 4th century A.D. And then were again restarted in modern times in 1894, I believe is the first date. They were a huge part of the ancient world, as Paul would have known it and the author of Hebrews would have known it. And therefore, we have several illustrations from Scripture about running this race applying what they saw and heard in their culture to spiritual life. And so I'd like to also see that today, and I think of a couple of passages that illustrate that. Uh, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 9, he says, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. He talks about how he must discipline his body in order to do so, just as, just as that Olympic runner must, must do so. I think of Philippians chapter 3, where Paul says, I press toward that goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. It's not that I've obtained, but, but I need to obtain through Christ, and so I press on in that upward call in Christ Jesus. And then he tells Timothy, in 2 Timothy 2, verse 5, he says, Also, if anyone competes in athletics, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. And then he concludes his message to Timothy in 2 Timothy 4, verse 7, saying, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the rules of the race. I have kept 
the faith. And therefore, I would like to address you with this passage also in our text. Chapter 12 of Hebrews, verse 1. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith recognizing that that is not an easy thing. I don't think anyone thinks that, the, that Andre de, de Grasse made it to the Olympics without a lot of training, a lot of hardships, and a lot of challenges. And so also, the race of faith. I'd like to address you with three things that come out of that race of faith. The first is the fears. Second, the jeers. And thirdly, the cheers. The race of faith, the fears in the race. Now, fear can sometimes be a good thing. Fear can be a good thing in the sense of fearing heights. And if you're walking around a tall silo or a tall building and you're walking around it, you wouldn't you would want to have some kind of fear of that height and fear of the danger that would await if you would fall down. You would want a, f- a fear of, of, of a busy highway. If you were standing in the middle of it, you would want to fear getting hit by a car so you could avoid the danger. Fear can be a good thing. But what I want to talk about here is an unhealthy fear, an unhealthy fear that robs us of our confidence. And that kind of fear needs to be laid aside, as Paul says. Therefore, we also, having this great cloud of witnesses, it ought to give us confidence to go forward. And, And what we must do with that confidence is lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily ensnares us. We need to lay away, lay aside all unhealthy, ungodly fear. Because that's the kind of fear that leaves us choked up or frozen and, and takes away all of our confidence. What are some of those fears in a race? Or there might be the fear of not being qualified, not being qualified for this race, and you have to do all of those qualifying runs, and you recognize your weakness. I look at some of the times of the runners that would be running 100 meters or 200 meters or even a marathon, and I can tell you I would be disqualified to compete with them, as many of us would be. And yet at the same time, that recognition of our weakness of not being qualified would also even affect the confidence of those who were almost at that point of making that qualifying race. But isn't that also true in spiritual life? When we look at our own failures, when we read something like Hebrews chapter 11, and we hear of the heroes of faith, like Abel, like Abraham, Moses, David. And we hear of all of these heroes of faith in Hebrews chapter 11. The list goes on and on, as you know. You hear of all of these heroes of faith. I think, how could I ever be qualified? How could I be qualified to serve God? I don't even match up close to Enoch who walked with God. Or a Daniel. And yet it's not about our qualification, is it? And that's why when we lay aside that fear and we do something else, when we look to the Lord Jesus Christ and we find our life in Him who is qualified, that gives us confidence. Our confidence should never be in ourselves. As a matter of fact, that's the only thing you ought to fear is that you have confidence in yourself. Our confidence is not in self. It is in Christ. And that's why we look to Christ. Isn't it a fear of intimidation when we see the strengths of 
our opponents even. As you run the race, there's opponents in that race. And I'm not talking about other Christians who are running the race with you. I'm talking about opponents that want to trip you up. I'm thinking of Satan. I'm thinking of the persuasion of the world. The power of indwelling sin in our own hearts and in our own lives. That intimidation. That's a fear. It's a fear. Well, how do we combat these fears? Our, it needs to be found in an identity in Christ. We can't identify with our weaknesses. That's not faith. Faith is being united to Christ. It gives us a new identity in Christ. We think about the Olympics, and we think about uh, Andre de Grasse or Usain Bolt, who, who represents Jamaica as, as well. And, and like Andre de Grasse, he, he would put Canada, as it were, on the map. Milton on the map. Andre de Grasse puts Jamaica on the map. Because they identify with a very country. But a Christian's identity is in God. The Christian's identity is in in heaven where Christ is. And so spiritually, our identity needs to be in God. It needs to be united to His majesty, united to His glory. It's not that we can attain who God is or we could add to who God is. But it's, it's so that we are identified with Him and we're running the race as the world is looking on. We're running this spiritual race as a representative of God's work in us and His gifts given to us. You see, a country like Jamaica could provide something for Usain Bolt. It could provide him some finances, some nice sporting arenas to train in and so on. But they can't give him strength. They can't keep him healthy. They can give him many gifts, but, but it's, it's only in God. It's only in God who can give power and strength through that identity in Christ. And so the only answer for failure, the only in- answer for intimidation, the only answer for feeling unqualified is to have an identity in Christ, to look to Jesus. That's a calling in the Christian race, to look to Jesus. And that gives true liberty to run the race with confidence in Him. You might say, Pastor, that seems like it's just too easy to be true. As a matter of fact, you might even argue and say, that's not the only weight that brings us down, the weight of being unqualified or intimidated. The weight that really brings me down is those jeers of my friends, the world, and all the distractions that are in it. That's why we want to secondly look at not only the fears, but the jeers in this race. You can almost hear the jeering crowd, can't you? Certainly that would be a weight that would drag us down and keep us from the finish line. Maybe children, you're wondering, what is a jeer? What is a jeer? Well, a jeer is a rude, insulting, mocking type of comment. You might, you might know it at a at, uh, basketball game or, or, or any other kind of sporting event where, where they might be jeering you. You might be hoping that you miss a shot and waving and distracting you. They're trying to distract you. That's what a jeer is. It's to distract you. And isn't that exactly what happens in our spiritual faith walk as well? Whatever would keep you from looking to Jesus and finding Jesus and seeing Jesus and knowing Jesus is a jeer. 
whether it's television programming, whether it's my own ambitions, whether it's maybe my hobbies, maybe, maybe some of it's my poor choice of friends, and so on. All of these things can be jeers to distract us from Jesus. Maybe sometimes it's, it's even your opponent's fans. There's nothing nice about them, is it? Is there? Where they're actually kind of secretly hoping that you fail. But isn't that exactly what the world does all around us? It seeks to amuse us and smile at us and, and bait us for ultimate failure to end up with them in hell forever. Remember, remember not only the, the faith of those in Hebrews chapter 11, but also recognize and remember the failures of those in chapter 11. You think of the faith of Abraham and how many times he didn't trip up. You think of the faith of Jacob, the deceiver. You think of the faith of Moses who, who struck the rock instead of speaking to it. You think, of, you think of the faith of all of these saints who are also sinners. And Satan will take those sins and he will show you, he will tell you how unfit, how unqualified you are, how big of a disgrace you are to the Lord. And he will seek to distract you from the Lord Jesus Christ. Those are the jeers, the real jeers of the race. And sometimes, unfortunately, even your own teammates are jeering you. They want to be number one on the team. They want to have the spotlight. And so your teammates are even running you down, making mocking, insulting, rude comments. We need to recognize that spiritually and even physically, there's no I in team. We are all one, united together in Christ. He is our head. He is to be exalted. We are to build one another up in Christ. Not tear one another down. what it means to be a Christian. Our teammates ought to never be the ones who jeer us. But how do we answer these real jeers from the world, from Satan, and even, unfortunately, from our own teammates many times? It's this, that we lay it all aside. We lay it all aside. We look away from it. We tune it out. We tune out all those negative things, and we look to Jesus. We look to His Word. We look to His promises. We pray to Him. We ask Him for His presence. We ask Him for His armor. And we take that armor, we take those gospel shoes, and we lace them up tightly, and we're prepared to run the race that's set before us as we look to Jesus. That's what we do as a Christian to confront the jeers in the race. We look to Jesus and His relationship. Really, looking to Jesus could be what we call an, a multi-purpose Christian advice. It almost serves every purpose in counseling. Look to Jesus. Look to Him. He will give you encouragement in the Christian life. Keep the glory of Christ in constant view. That will revive your souls, give you energy to flourish and thrive in the race. Put off everything else and put on Christ, says Paul. Isn't that true of every relationship? When we keep away things that hinder us from having good, a good 
husband-wife relationship and we focus on what's good in our relationship and we encourage one another in our relationship, guess what? It's going to flourish. So also in the family of God. You see, it's not just only a relationship with Jesus. Even when we're looking to Jesus, we also recognize our number two, Relationship in the family of God. Number one, in Christ. Number two, as one body in Christ. In the family of God. And therefore, this section really begins in chapter 10. Let us consider one another to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together. What family would ever forsake assembling of themselves together? What marriage would ever forsake assembling together? Let alone the family, the body of Christ that's been bought with His precious blood. Put off all else and put on Christ. That's how you combat the jeers of this world. In this race, there's going to be fears and jeers. And I think it only shows us the necessity for the cheers, the cheers in the race of faith. Listen again. The cheers that are driving on, spurring you on, that extra spring in your step, a tenth of a second boost tenth of a second that will be cut off your final time. Listen to those cheers. That cloud of witnesses that's cheering you on. Therefore, being surrounded by such a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and look to Jesus. The first witness is Jesus Himself. He's the first and the last. He's really our coach, isn't he? He's the one who's training us. He's the one who's guiding us. He's preparing the way. He wants what's best for us. He desires that we would excel. And you can hear him cheering us on. And maybe sometimes those cheers even sound a little bit like jeers. But they're not to mock us or to bring us down, but rather to come alongside and instruct and encourage and motivate us as He, as he takes us as His disciple, giving us our faith and perfecting that faith in us. He's our coach. He provides teammates. Teammates who, who aren't jeering us. Teammates who are wanting what's best for one another. To give us tips in life and how to live a godly life. Tips on how to, how to properly live out our Christian life in a very practical way in family and in relationships, in business, and so on. I think of someone who's training for the Olympics and, and how their teammates come alongside and encourage one another. They're giving one another tips on diet and how to discipline themselves and how to, how to be fully engaged in training and what training methods work best. That's what we ought to be as Christians. Encouraging one another. Seeking what's best for one another. The cheers of the race. You hear our fans cheering us. Really, the church of all ages. Oh, to be surrounded by a cloud of witnesses from Genesis to Revelation throughout history, cheering us on. Isn't it so encouraging when you open up God's Word and you hear and read about the faith of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph and Moses and David and Daniel? And the list goes on. And we can almost hear them in their very lives and the realness of the Old Testament cheering us on to look to Jesus. 
and to run that race with patience and endurance in Him. And to hear the witnesses of Augustine, of John Calvin, of John Bunyan, and the list could go on of godly witnesses. And we can open up their books and to hear how to live in such a time as this. We have hip witnesses cheering us on here in the present. We have families to encourage us to have influence in our life. The blessing of family and godly family and the covenant line to, to, to encourage us in godliness and faithfulness. We have a church family, as we pointed out already. What a cloud of witnesses to cheer us on. Can I ask you something? In the Olympics, would you ever think that in the 100-meter dash that a record would be set to never be broken? What's the goal of the race? It's to get better. What's the goal of Christian life, of faith, the race of faith? Is it to go backwards? Why would we be always settling for bronze? Maybe not even getting to the podium at all. Wouldn't we want to break records? Wouldn't we want the next generation to be more godly? To be more faithful? To be more zealous for the things of God? Would we want them to be less? Records are made to be broken. How do we do that? Well, we're not going to do that by looking at ourselves, are we? We need to come back full circle to that foundational secret. Because all the cheers, even if they're of family, of our church family, of the church of all ages even, all those cheers are in the background as we look steadfastly to Jesus, our coach, in the race. And as we're looking to Him, we recognize that He is the one who is the author of it. He's the author of our faith. He's the one, in other words, you could even translate, the forerunner of that race of faith. He's the one who pioneered that race of faith. He blazed the trail for us to run that race of faith. And He's the finisher of it. The one who perfected it. The one who gives us a perfect example of how to live the faith. And as that pioneer, and as that perfecter, or finisher, he shows us a glorious example of how to run the race. I think it's displayed most evidently and brilliantly on the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, where God put his only begotten son to the very test. And even the religious authorities around him looked up at him hanging on the cross and say, he trusts in God. Let him save him. What they didn't know while they were mocking him, how very true their statement was. He indeed trusted in God. He was a perfect example of faith because Jesus pleased God and walked with God far more excellently than Enoch did. And even far greater than Abraham did, Jesus looked forward to a city whose foundations were in God and He built it with His own life. 
and he purchased it with his own blood as it becomes the cornerstone laying down that supreme sacrifice for his people. His faith was far more excellent than Moses who set aside the glory of Egypt to lead God's people to the promised land. Jesus laid down the glory that he had from all eternity with his Father to lead his people to be with him forever and ever in the eternal promised land. By faith, Jesus made a far better sacrifice than Abel could have ever. Even though the heroes of faith in the Old Testament are lights for us to encourage us, the Lord Jesus Christ Himself is a brilliant display of faith. As He suffered the shame of the cross, leaving this an example for us. But not only did he as the author and finisher of our faith give us an example, he he gives us joy in what he's done. And we see how true joy can be had in the Lord Jesus Christ. It was for the joy that was set before Him that He endured the cross. He finished that race. He finished it to drink the last of the dregs of the cup of the wrath of God in order for us, in order for us to also cross that finish line with Him to a future crowning with Him forever. Isn't that really what an Olympian wants? He wants to delight and to share in joy and the glory of the accomplishment that he's had and to receive the medal and to be able to take it home and to be honored for that achievement. Oh, how much greater did the Lord Jesus Christ accomplish far more than any Olympian, than all of the Olympians, all together of all time and all of history, accomplish for us, for his people. And now, to be able to share in that spiritual joy that there is in the author and finisher of our faith. He's not only the author of it, a finisher of it, the joy of it. He's, he's the very source of it. The source of that life. He's the one who supplies us in the race. He's not some long dead hero. He's not some kind of philosophical ideal. He is the source of life, the source of faith. He empowers us in the race. That's where you turn. Thomas Watson wrote, As the Spirit is at work in the heart, so is Christ at work in heaven. He's at work in heaven at the right hand of God and He sends His Spirit to work in our heart to give us life, to give us everything we need in this race. And didn't He tell Peter, I have prayed for you that your faith fail not. Dear congregation, how can the children of such prayers, how can the runners in the race of such prayers ever fail or perish? He reigns with power from on high and He does so in us and for us. You want that kind of life in Christ to be filled with the power of Christ, to experience the joy of Christ, to finish the race in Christ. And you must fix your eyes on Jesus. Take them off the world and everything in it and consider how great of a Savior He truly is. That's one thing about the Olympics, isn't it? No matter how impressive the athletes are and their records in, as they compete in these games, it reminds us, compared to the supernatural abilities of God and His power, they seem suddenly puny 
and even slow. I mean, you can think about Bolt running 100 meters, setting world records. But they seem kind of meaningless when you see a risen Christ being transported from one place to another in an instant. You see those weightlifters lifting those big weights, and you're impressed. I could never lift a tenth of it. And you're impressed until you remember a hero of faith from Hebrews 11 who is given power and strength from God to tear down the temple. Samson. You think of the great achievements in water sports. And you think about Jesus who walked on water. Who called out from the bow of the boat and said, the waves and the sea be still. And they were still. Who has power like Jesus? Is that an encouragement for you as you run the race today? See, we're not running 100 meters to get to the end. We're running a marathon. A marathon. Until the Lord takes us to himself. Or he comes again. We're running a marathon with lots of fears. With mind games. With jeers. Oh, look to Jesus. Forget what is behind Lay off every weight in the sin that slows us down and press forward to the prize of the high calling that there is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we give you thanks that you are the source of our strength of our faith. You are our example to live by in faith. You are the source of joy in this marathon. Lord, give us strength to persevere, to endure, to come to the end. And to hear the words of our Lord Jesus Christ saying, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Well done, good and faithful marathon runner. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Go with us, Lord, for we are weak and frail and disqualified in ourself. And fill us with your spirit and fill us with the joy of knowing Christ. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.